You're listening to the Bluffton Biblecast, a podcast designed to accompany and encourage you as you explore this year's Bible reading plan. Hi, I'm Hayden Craighead, and I'm here with Lori Fichter and Corinne Kirshner. This week is our fourth week in Deuteronomy. We will be reading chapters 12 through 16. Before we dig into this week's scripture, let's take a look at the book of Deuteronomy as a whole. What have we read so far? where we are this week, and what we have to look forward to in these last few weeks in the Torah. Lori, could you give us a quick run-through? Will do. The book of Deuteronomy is composed of a series of speeches from Moses to the Israelites, calling them to be faithful to their covenant with God. The first speech, chapters 1 through 11, is Moses' opening speech, telling the people what God has done for them up until now, and then Moses calling them to faithfulness. Chapters 12 through 26 is a collection of laws, basically the terms of the covenant between God and the Israelites. Some of these laws are new, but most of them aren't. Chapters 27 through 34 is Moses' final address, his last words, and his death. Thanks for that overview, Lori. That was very helpful. And Hayden, would you be willing to tell us what the chapters we are reading this week are about? Yes, of course. As Lori mentioned in the overview, we are at the beginning of the section about laws. This specific section that we will be covering are laws about proper worship. Chapter 12 covers how there will be one temple and one altar for sacrifices for their one God. Chapter 13 is a warning against worshiping other gods. Chapter 14 covers clean and unclean food and tithes. Chapter 15 talks about lending money, slaves, and firstborn animals. And finally, chapter 16 talks about celebration in the first part of the chapter and ends with a part from the second set of laws Moses talks to the people about, laws regarding ruling the nation. Wow, we cover quite a bit of ground in these five chapters. A lot of these laws sound familiar to me, probably because we talked about them back in Leviticus. And it is important for us to remember that Moses is repeating them because they are important. And once they entered the promised land, the people will be all spread out and some things will change. But most important thing will stay the same, serving their one God. Now, let's dig into these chapters. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Do you recognize that line from the hymn, Whiter Than Snow? I thought of that line while reading Deuteronomy 12.3. You shall tear down their altars and dash into pieces their pillars and burn down their ashram with fire. You shall chop down their carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. That verse is replete with action verbs of destruction. Tear down, dash into pieces, burn, chop down, destroy. Wow, does this command seem excessively harsh? It certainly does not jibe with the modern mantras of live and let live, coexist, and why can't we all just get along? Once more, the holiness of being a separate people is what is at stake here. There is no coexisting of holy and evil, no toleration of the abominable worship practices of the Canaanites. This was even countercultural in ancient times, too. Because building materials were not easy to come by, it was common to refurbish what already exists. If there is an altar to another god, typically they would just use it for the new god. But why did Israel have to be a separate people? We have been reading throughout the Torah how God chose them and his possession out of all the other nations. The Israelites had the true religion. The Canaanites worshipped a lie and were enslaved by that lie. God wanted to keep his children free, but they would have to follow his commands to stay in the truth. That's right. As Warren Wearsby commented, Israel was even to wipe out the names of the pagan deities because their names might be used in occult practices to cast spells. We live in a world that has abandoned absolutes and promoted plurality. As long as it helps you, one religion is just as good as another religion. And it isn't politically correct to claim that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world. But Moses made it clear that God rejected the Canaanite religions and wanted all evidence of their pagan practices removed from the land. The land belonged to the Lord, and he had every right to purge it. God wanted nothing to do with the pagan deities because he is the one Lord. David Guzik states, This is where the worship of many is corrupt. It isn't that they worship too little. They worship too much. They worship the Lord and the things of the world. God doesn't want such worship. It is an abomination to him. Practices like child sacrifice 
and drinking blood are forbidden, even though their culture accepted it. God stated in verse 31, You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. God shows himself as different from the little g gods. He is separate from them, so he commands Israel to be separate from those that serve those gods. Because of the separation, Israel was able to preserve the Holy Scriptures for us. Because of that separation, there was still a Judah and a house of David so that the Messianic line would be preserved. The Jewish people remained a separate people who survived to this day because God willed it. The Jewish people survive today because God still has promises to keep. There is coming a great day when the eyes of God's chosen people will be opened and they will weep when they see those nail prints and that pierced side. Or as it is written in Zechariah twelve ten and thirteen one and 2, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him who they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. On that day there will be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sins and uncleanness. On that day, declares the Lord of the host, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they will be remembered no more. One day every idol will indeed be broken. In the space of 12 verses, Moses talked multiple times about pouring out the blood from the sacrifices. Twice he said to pour it out on the ground and once to pour it out on the altar. Why is he so adamant about not drinking the blood and about pouring it out? Corinne, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, there are actually several reasons why eating and drinking blood was forbidden. First, and most likely the largest reason, was that blood represents life, which is sacred to God and belongs to God. It was also a symbol of sacrifice that had to be made for sin, a shedding of blood. And lastly, blood was an integral part of pagan practices in the land that the Israelites were about to enter and they were called to be set apart and different. That makes me think, it was probably hard for the disciples when Jesus told them to drink of his blood. They had been taught from a young age that drinking blood was forbidden. It can be hard to read a chapter like Deuteronomy 13 because of how harsh the consequences seem. This is not to say that the Bible is wrong or that God shouldn't have been so harsh. It is to say that it can be hard for some of us to process the reality of these scriptures, while remembering that God's ways and thoughts are higher than ours. What do you think, Ren? This is something that can be good to struggle through. When we see severe consequences in the Bible, most scholars look at this as an emphasis of the point that's being made. So let's step back from the consequences and look at why God is handing out these consequences. The consequences in the first section is death. These prophets and dreamers deserved death because they taught rebellion against the Lord. In verse 5, the emphasis is on God despising rebellion against him. And the second section, verses 6 through 11, is more of the same. It is death to those that sought to draw you away from the Lord your God. The caveat with this is that even their brothers, sons, daughters, spouses, and friends fall into this category. So God is putting emphasis on not turning away from him. No one, a prophet, a dreamer, a brother, a son, a daughter, a spouse, nor a friend, should be allowed to entice the Israelites away from God. There should be no ties between men that is greater than the ties between a man and God. This reminds me of Jesus' teachings, one being found in Matthew ten thirty seven, where he said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus teaches us the same thing we read about in Deuteronomy. We've enjoyed digging into God's Word together, and we pray that all of us can continue to glorify God as we gain more knowledge of Him through these readings. Thanks for tuning in to the BibleCast this week, and we look forward to the weeks to come.